welcome to Sports Management Podcast, where you will hear interesting sports management professionals share their stories, experiences, and passion for the sports management industry. I am your host, Marcus Philipsson. Today's guest is Matthew Barrett, the co-founder of GoldClick. GoldClick is a global football storytelling platform helping people understand one another and the world through football. They share stories from people from around the world and more often than not from people who usually don't get their voices heard. Matthew have a multidisciplinary background in sports, spanning communication, sponsorship sales and partnership activation, working with international brands and rights holders. But the last eight years, he's been working for GoldClick. Get ready to learn why GoldClick's first ever story is so important to Matthew his best advice for people in the sports industry, how COVID put Gold Click into hibernation, and much more. Matthew Barrett, welcome to the Sports Management Podcast. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, I'm currently at the World Cup in Doha, and I will be here for a little bit longer. And you uh, have enjoyed some games there? I've enjoyed some games so far. I was at Germany, Costa Rica last night, which was pretty wild. And yeah, this World Cup certainly heating up. Definitely. And uh, yeah, that game was a wild one. At some point, uh, Costa Rica could have eliminated both Spain and uh, Germany. Exciting game. There was a few glorious minutes when that was the case. (laughs) That's true. So uh, yeah, and you work uh, with football. Uh, You are the co-founder of Gold Click. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is Gold Click and uh, how it started and uh, the journey up until where we are now? Absolutely. So. Gold Click is a global football storytelling platform. What does that actually mean? Um, it means that we find people from all around the world um, and we ask them to tell their own stories about their lives, their teams, their communities, all connected to and through the lens of football. So that is uh, everyone from elite players to fans to grassroots coaches and players to refugees to people in conflict zones. It, it really is uh, the whole world shown through football uh, and our method is to do this through a first-person perspective. So it's about giving people the the power, the freedom, the control to tell their own story rather than coming in from the outside and telling it about them. So, um, yeah, that's that's what we are. We were founded in 2014 by myself um, and a friend of mine, Ed Jones. I'd say the roots of Gold Click and the origins were maybe long before that, but the idea came about in 2014, and uh, it snowballed from there, really. Our initial medium was photography, uh, specifically analog disposable photography. So all the people who've taken part in Gold Click start with one of those cameras. Uh, and then alongside that, they write their own story. We've started evolving into video and audio, and uh, we have lots of exhibitions as well around the world. So um, yeah, it's really grown and evolved over those eight years. But yeah, that was our, um, that was our journey. And, and that's what we do. That's great. And as you said, you are a storytelling platform and uh, you help people understand each other through the world of football. That's a pretty powerful uh, statement. It is a powerful statement. And I think that we feel that the best way to understand people is to hear from them directly. And there are a lot of issues in the world that are very complicated um, and we often don't hear from the people who are directly living them. And so our whole ethos is to hand over that control and and get out the way somewhat. Because I think often people have this concept around football being this kind of unifying force. And I'm not sure we agree in terms of it being that simple, but we think what it does do is it allows people to understand one another by giving an insight into someone's culture, into their society, into their life, into their team, into their day-to-day living in a way that often isn't possible when you don't kind of give that person a platform and room to tell their story as they see it. So you provide this uh, storytelling platform and then everyone can, from around the world, upload their own photos and uh, tell their own stories and connect with each other. Is that how it works? It's not quite like that. It's not, not kind of a, a self-policing commune in that, in that way. Um, we work very deeply with specific people. So mm. it's more of a recruitment and identification of the people who we want to be part of the storytelling and um, sometimes they find us sometimes we find them sometimes they're nominated by partners that we work with so we tend to work over the long term quite deeply with the people who take part in gold click and um, so it's less around 
it's less user generated content that kind of is uploaded somewhere. And it's more about working with people over the long term through a real process to kind of make them comfortable to share their story and really bring the story out of them through photography, through written word, through video. So yeah, it's definitely a we call it slow form content sometimes rather than short form or, or long form because of the time it takes often to work with the people that we work with. I understand. Yeah, and some of those partners are, I mean, uh, big organizations and uh, FIFA, UEFA, and now the Qatar, Adidas. So how is that cooperation working exactly? And uh, well, like, what is the value that they see that you bring to them? Yeah, so yeah, GoClick has two main strands, really. We do our original content that we obviously fund and is pro bono. We work with people from all around the world, whether it be uh, amputee footballers in Sierra Leone or women's football teams in Pakistan. And then we also work with lots of organizations and charities, um, such as the UNHCR, where we do a lot of storytelling in, in refugee, asylum seeker and internally displaced communities. And um, so that is the kind of majority of our content. But then we also do collaborations and partnerships with big organizations. And that is ultimately our business model. And so we will work with brands. Obviously, you mentioned people like Adidas and EE and Hummel. Um, we work with clubs and governing bodies and foundations. And with those organizations, we develop bigger, deeper, original content series where we will focus on a specific topic or theme that might be a city, a country, an initiative, an issue in the world, um, a tournament. Um, and we will develop a series with multiple storytellers around that topic. So with the likes of uh, UEFA, that could be working with elite women's players in the UEFA Women's Champions League. With New York City Football Club, that could be taking participants from their community projects to be the storytellers and as you mentioned, we've, we've done a lot of work in Qatar over the last four years, seeking that local perspective of people who live and work here. And we've done that in partnership with Qatar Foundation over the last year. We've worked with a huge variety of partners, whether it be the Premier League, the FA, Everton, Southampton, the Dutch FA, uh, UNICEF, Laureus. It, it, the list is becoming endless, which is great. In terms of the value that they see, I think that I see GoldClick as having credibility in this storytelling space. and being a very trusted and credible partner. Um, our method, I think, is something that really draws people in. It's very different to really hand over control to the people who are being affected by work that you're doing and have them ultimately as a storyteller rather than the subject. So I think that the, the methodology um, and the process is really attractive to organizations who are desperate to tell great stories, but do it in a way that feels a bit more raw, a bit more authentic, a bit more real. And often people are overlooked, marginalized, dispossessed, silenced in their voices. And this is really giving room for, for people to, to tell their story as they see it. So I think that's what people like working with GoldClick for. I think also the style of content, you know, whether that be the analog disposable photography or whether it be the, the written word or whether it be the self-created video, there's something, again, that is a little bit more honest and raw and you know, draws people in in a way that maybe high production content, which we love, obviously, um, doesn't always generate. Yeah, that's true. And also, I feel like this is a little bit like behind the scenes content. Like you mm -hmm. can see how someone has it that uh, mm -hmm. in a country where you are not aware of their culture. So there has been a lot of this behind the scenes content that really seemed to pick up. We often describe ourselves as a hybrid of user generated content with narrative documentary. I think that's a really good way to see it. it. It is going behind the scenes, but it's doing it in a way that is understandable and coherent and often breaking down quite complicated issues into something that is understandable and digestible. I mean, you look at the work we do in, in refugee communities. So there is a massive issue that I think people do care about generally. I think football fans do care about it, but it's not a priority. And so when you start to hear stories and see photos and get under the skin of, of people's existence, and it's in a football context, it becomes a lot more accessible and easier to understand and have empathy than if it was maybe a series of facts or content that felt quite overwhelming. I think football is that entry point into people's lives and that then allows us to kind of understand bigger, broader, more complicated topics. It's almost by stealth, <laughs> almost by stealth kind of football allows people to come into contact with issues that maybe they wouldn't otherwise 
come into contact with. And also that someone that has not been a refugee or been into war, it might be difficult to put oneself in that person's shoes. And then maybe football can be the common thread that this is what you have in common and that can start something from there. Absolutely. It's a common language, I think, is how we often try and say it because we can all identify somewhat with people when there is football context. And we might not have many other things in common, but it is that initial lens through which we can truly start to have empathy with other people's existence. We mentioned a couple of partners before, but uh, now when we are talking, I see from a tourism perspective, could this be something uh, as well? Maybe that, uh, you know, you see someone from other countries that playing football there and, you know, you want to widen your horizon. You know what? I've never been asked that question before. And I love that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have absolutely no doubt that football is a great way to start to break down myths and stereotypes and misconceptions about other countries. And I think that when you see football being inclusive, when you see football arousing strong passions, when you see landscapes and scenery and crowds in places that you maybe had not considered before, I think that definitely there is uh, there's something to be said for the kind of storytelling that we do, almost being a bit of a tourism play. Um, it's not something we've actively done before or explored. We've never worked with any tourism companies, but I think we all know that a lot of people do travel to football matches in parts of the world to experience those kind of different cultures. People definitely go to Buenos Aires to experience the passion of, of football in, in that city. And so whilst we do do a lot of fan perspective and fan culture, I think also the fact that we're working a lot in the grassroots world does start to give people a different perspective of countries that maybe they hadn't considered before um, as places that might be attractive or safe to travel to. And hearing from people who live there about what the reality is like for them, I'm sure might be an attractive way of, of getting people to put it on their travel list. Yeah. I personally, there's definitely some places that I've seen as part of doing Gold Click that I'm now a lot more interested to visit one day. So, yeah, it's a very good question that I've never considered before. Mm. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. And, uh, yeah, I used to think, you know, sports tourism in general, and this feels like a very good uh, way since you have one extra layer to it, I would say. So, interesting. You have also hosted some uh, exhibitions uh, yourself, Gold Click, in uh, around the world, Doha, London, Moscow, and so forth. What do you do on these type of exhibitions, and what's the goal with them? So the exhibitions are usually the, the climax of a project, almost the icing on the cake, if you will. Most of the content that GoldClick creates is primarily for digital and social media, and that's our primary form of uh, distribution and amplification. But you can't be a physical event, <laughs> as we've known from the last few years. There's something very special about bringing work and art, photography and words together in an exhibition. And... We have tended to do exhibitions at major football events, and we've had exhibitions at the Euros in 2016, at the World Cup in Russia in 2018, during the Women's World Cup in France, and obviously now in Qatar during the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Um, and alongside those exhibitions, we often run events whereby people can come and see the work and engage with it and, and often hear from storytellers who have been involved uh, in the work. So whilst they're not necessarily the uh, primary focus of our content, they are a very important climax of the work that we do often. If we talk a little bit about you and uh, your career, you have a multidisciplinary sure. background. You have uh, done a lot of different things from the work in sports uh, industry, communication, sponsorship, sales. So uh, how did your professional career start? And then why did you uh, decide to be an entrepreneur and to co-found GoldClick? Uh, yeah, I I've had to recently really start considering myself as an entrepreneur. It's something that never necessarily was in my mind. I don't feel like I was necessarily encouraged to think entrepreneurially um, when I was younger. So this is all slightly learning as I go along, if I'm being really honest, um, which I think is maybe the best way. But in terms of where I've come from, I actually think the origin story, which I always like to tell, is that when I was at university studying history, I had two great loves. I loved studying uh, the Second World War, and 
I loved playing sport outside of my academic life. And one day, my uh, professor at university said to me, have you considered fusing these two things together? At which point I said, no, but maybe I should. Um, and in the end, I then started focusing on sport, politics and war in the 20th century. I wrote my thesis on sport in the British Army in the Second World War. And that really started my interest in sport and geopolitics and sport and societies and sport and human beings and how they use sport as part of their daily lives, particularly in areas and in countries and in times when there is broader political, social, economic issues at play. So I think I wanted to be a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> I think I wanted to be telling stories like we now are with Gold Click. But initially, I went into the more commercial sports industry. I worked um, for various different agencies within the WPP network. I worked in communications, in sponsorship sales, in consultancy for different agencies, Hill and Northern Strategies, ESP, and Two Circles. And it was an amazing learning ground to learn about media, to learn about content, to learn about sponsorship, to learn about partnerships, to learn about how the industry works. But always in the back of my mind was that scratch, <laughs> uh, that itch, which was wanting to tell these kind of stories that Goldclick is telling. And yeah, in the end, it was a very easy decision to segue. I had grown Goldclick for four years um, alongside my sports industry career. And it was at the point where I felt that I wanted to give it a real go full time. So just before the Russian World Cup, went full time on Goldclick. And yeah, since then, the model has been to create partnerships with big organizations in order to then fund the business and to be an entrepreneur. But that also, you know, funds the other work that we do, which we don't charge for. And so, yeah, we describe ourselves as a social business. We have broader purpose and ethical aims um, around our storytelling, but whilst also being cognizant that we are a business that wants to do good work with the industry at large. So, yeah, that is where it came from. That's the, the origins. And yeah, I mean, we are always drawn to stories where there is something more interesting from a geopolitical perspective or a social issue, which is coming through the storytelling. It's why we gravitate towards certain parts of the world. Some of our most impactful stories have come from women's football in Iran, in Nepal, in Pakistan. It's come from refugee communities in, in Jordan um, and Kenya. It's come from diverse communities across the world, both in countries like Germany and, and England, as well as Argentina and, and Sierra Leone and every country in between. <laughs> so yeah, we feel we've created something that's really diverse, really meaningful, and profiling a lot of voices that otherwise wouldn't be heard in areas which can sometimes be ignored and overlooked and silenced. And I'm guessing now you mentioned that you're in Doha and uh, this uh, World Championship obviously has been talked about in a uh, different light and not always positive. So I, I assume that there are stories to tell from Doha that, uh, and that's <laughs> why you are there, I assume. There sure are. I think we always find in almost every area that we work in that the conversation is always incomplete if you're not asking the people who are most impacted by an issue. And we believe that over the last years, amid all the criticism and debate of this tournament, that we've really heard from people that live and work in Qatar, whether it be migrant workers, whether it be students, artists, football coaches, our contribution towards this debate is to give those voices more prominence. And we've done a series with 41 people who live and work in Qatar chronicling the year um, leading up to the World Cup. The majority of the storytellers are women, which is something that I think surprises people. 20 different nationalities, obviously drawn from a whole range of backgrounds, um, from Ghanaian electricians to Iranian women's football players to Bangladeshi labourers turned football coaches. And we've done that in partnership with a broad range of organisations, um, the Sports Creative, Generation Amazing, Qatar Foundation and Salam Stores. And we have an exhibition uh, for one month during the World Cup. And it's landed really positively with the football world because I think people have not heard these kind of voices that much previously. And whilst, again, we never claim that 
our work is telling every single angle it's providing a, a different perspective and one that we think needs to be told so yeah would encourage you and any listeners to um to take a look at that work um because definitely the the women and girls who have been involved tell really interesting stories from from life in Qatar that i think challenge and surprise those who see and read them for sure so if the listeners uh, want to look at your content and your storytellings where do they do that they can go onto our website at goal-click.com they can um, follow us on social media at goal click on instagram and at goal underscore click on twitter lots of hyphens and underscores we we haven't quite got the uh we haven't got the consistency of, of all of that but yeah that's how they can see stories and th- the range is quite remarkable actually to go from stories in Qatar to stories of you know fans all around the world to um grassroots communities and right the way up to elite players particularly in the women's game um we like it when people get slightly lost in the website <laughs> for for an extended period of time because there's there's a lot of material and there's a lot of different perspectives to see yeah so to make it easier for everyone i will put uh, your website and your uh, social media not that it was that difficult but even easier in the show notes <laughs> it's reasonably below. difficult reasonably <laughs> difficult uh, so i mean if, ultimately if you google go click you'll find everything <laughs> yeah i should do that but if if someone is uh, extra lazy you can just scroll down in the show notes and it will be a link <laughs> exactly there. exactly Circling back to uh, to your career, you mentioned that you work for Two Circles and uh, we have had Matt Rogan here on the episode previously, who's one of the co-founders of that. You have also done uh, an internship with the IMG, which is now Endeavor, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Mm-hmm. So with this in mind and also all the previous experience that you mentioned, what are some key learnings that you have taken during your career that you are using now in your current role? So (laughs) I actually think for a long time, I thought that you had to learn everything before you began. And I think that there is definitely an impression given, particularly by people who maybe found their own companies or people who work in the industry, that you need to be a real smart business brain to develop your ideas and to create a company. And actually, the the more I've done what I've done, the, the more I've realized that no one really knows what they're doing. <laughs> um, and and everyone is just making the best judgments as they go along based upon the knowledge of what they see working for them and for others. And there's no one route to success. And I think that there's no such thing as a sure run thing and, and genius. It's about surrounding yourself with good people. It's about trusting other people to do a good job. And it's about trusting yourself to make the right judgments. And you might get it wrong sometimes, and that's okay. I think one thing I, that I've really respected in people who I've been managed by is in fostering a culture of safety where you're not afraid to try things and do things wrong. And also where there's a realization that we don't necessarily have all the answers immediately and that there isn't a handbook and a manual to get everything right. So yeah, I think, those are things that I've really taken away from the great leaders that I've worked under. And that's what I try to do with Gold Click. Because, yeah, I think there is sometimes quite a damaging sense that, you know, only a certain type of person can create a successful company. And I don't think that's true. I think there's many different ways we can do it. And I think people are often put off starting a company and being an entrepreneur because it feels like, you know, they don't have the right training or the right qualification or the right skill or the right experience. And, and really we're, we're all just doing the best we can as we go along. So yeah, I don't think that's talked about very much. I think that a lot of people want to project that they know the answer or they, they know everything that was going to happen. And I don't think that's true. <laughs> so if you've got an idea, go for it. You know, obviously you need to have security and, and safety and, uh, you know, be able to, live your life but i always am encouraging of people to slowly develop their ideas and surround themselves with good people to try and take those ideas forward and not think oh i can't possibly do that because of x y and z i completely agree with you i love that and i think that if you're waiting for it needs to be perfect before you start then you will never start 
Amen. Don't let don't let great get in the way of good is a really good sentence that is oversaid, but it genuinely is true. If we all wait for that perfect series of events, we'll never do anything. Um, and of course, we've had we've had setbacks along the way, um, but generally, as long as the arc is progressing in the right direction, you're on the right track. And uh, yeah, I guess that uh, could answer the question also for your best advice for people. And then you made a really good segue into my second question, which is, has there been any bumps on the road in your career? And if so, how did you overcome them? Well, COVID was a big bump for Goldflip. We basically went into hibernation mode for the best part of a year. I think we were quite lucky at that stage that we were a relatively small organization and we could hibernate. And then coming out of COVID, things really took off for us. But I guess having the strength of the conviction that we were on the right track was quite important because I think that could have been a time when we thought, oh, well, maybe Goldcliff isn't destined to become something more than it was. So that was definitely a, a bump. And that was probably the main one. I think I personally lacked a bit of courage to take risks a little bit sooner uh, and to maybe try new things a bit quicker. One eminent figure in the sports industry once said to me that um, in your 20s you should try and work in as many different roles in as many different sectors uh, in as many different countries as you can um, because in your 30s you can then start to specialize and I think that's a really good piece of advice that I didn't take I got told it too late <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think you know I think people often think they need to like show that they've worked for a long period of time in a company you know, in their 20s, but I'm actually not sure that is true. And I think trying new things and being a bit of a sponge for information and for ways of doing things is a really, a really good piece of advice. And actually building on that, somebody else in the sector, uh, I'll even name him, Nathan Homer, once basically said that there are, there are four buckets within the sports sector. There's brand, there's agency, there's media, and there's rights holder. And if you can find a way to work within all four at a relatively young age, you're going to know the ins and outs of every part of the sports industry. And again, not a piece of advice I followed, but I've told that to many people who have then internalized that and tried to do it. Because I think the more exposed we have to all different parts of the sector, the better you are equipped to deal with challenges and understand what other people are coming from as they go along. So yeah. Maybe some people have come on and say, bed down in one and show commitment. I guess I'm probably saying try and experience as many different things as possible early on in a career and maybe later in a career. Maybe it's never too late to keep learning and keep trying new things. So, yeah, maybe that's not just advice for younger people. No, that's a great advice and something that I think, as I said, like if you can do it in your 20s, great. To have insight from the different sectors or from the different buckets of the sports industry, that's so valuable, of course. And going back to what you said with the goal click during your hibernation, during COVID and everything, one advice that I heard from a person working in sports was just don't stop. If you have a company or whatever, what you're working on. The most important thing is not, you know, the hockey stick growth that you need to do that. Just continue, do the work and don't stop. And at some point it's going to take off. I fully, fully agree. Sometimes there's a sense the people that succeed are the people that just kept going. <laughs> um, I think that something that I'm really proud of with Goldclick is that we've never taken on investment. I know that sounds a bit odd to say, but we probably could have gone quicker, but what we've done is we've built really, really strong foundations and a really strong purpose and a really strong method and a really strong style. And I think we are now seeing the fruits of that in that people really understand who we are and what we do. We're not trying to be lots of things for lots of different people. And slow, steady bootstrap growth is one direction that people can go in and that's the direction that we've gone in. And I feel really comfortable with that. So there's lots of different ways to, to do it we've chosen this direction and at the moment it's it's the progress is is coming um and that has been you know it's not been a quick process you know eight years of the company four years of me full-time you know two three years of like really becoming a fully sustainable organization you know good things take time 
Um, and I think that sometimes we try and rush things and that doesn't necessarily always end well. Agreed. Is there something that I haven't asked you yet uh, that you would like to bring up or is something from Gold Click that you feel is important to mention that I haven't asked you? That's a great question. Um, I think that in some ways it's slightly at odds with our whole mission for me to be the person that is even talking to you. Obviously, I have to do it as the founder and the most visible face of Gold Click, but the whole ethos of Gold Click is to hear the words and see the stories from other people. And I always try and highlight a few amazing stories and amazing people that we've that we've worked with because I think it's otherwise counter to everything that we stand for. So some of the, the storytellers that I often like to to pick out are our first ever storyteller, Pastor Abraham Bangura, um, who was the coach of the Sierra Leone amputee football team and also a church minister. And he took photos of the team training in Freetown. And really, I do sometimes wonder without those photos coming from that very first camera, which are breathtaking, and the story is incredibly powerful as well, where we would be today. What would have happened if our first few cameras weren't amazing? So his story is really powerful as someone that also lost fingers to a grenade. And I think our generally our women and girls who take part in Gold Click, the majority of our storytellers are uh, are women and girls. And there's some incredibly powerful stories because in every single country, it is harder for women and girls to participate in football. Now, I'm not saying that men don't have really difficult lives in many part, parts of the world, but every single level in society, you have two people who are equal on everything else except for gender. It is always harder and there are more obstacles and more challenges for women and girls to play. And when we work with Afghan refugees in Australia or Austria, or when we work with women who are setting up the first league for girls in northern Pakistan, or when we work with Iranian photographers who are documenting um, the Iranian women's football team, I'm always really, really inspired by their um, determination, conviction, and drive to exist in a world that has often not included them. And so I would absolutely encourage people to check out the stories of Samira in Pakistan, of Blessy in India, of Mariam in Iran, and countless, countless others to kind of read their perspective and, and see their world, because that's what this is all about. Um, yeah, I would encourage people to read those stories um, all yeah. the way up to you know, the US Women's National Team that we've worked with. And everyone might think that that's a story that is not relevant to Gold Click, but actually, you know, even elite women's football is a world where there's significant challenges and significant barriers still to overcome, even from the most high profile players in the world. So um, Gold Click will always be drawn to those stories of challenge and underdog and people overcoming barriers. It's really rooted in our DNA. Yeah, and I mean, uh, people like to support the underdogs as well, and in uh, storytelling specifically. And uh, so uh, very important work that you do to, I mean, highlight these individuals. And uh, But I also think that it's a, there is a big interest out, out there for these type of stories. There really is. And I think that my message to also... Um, organizations in the sports sector is that it might be harder and it might take more time <laughs> to give away the control but it's so much more powerful hearing it from the people themselves and I really hope that there is a movement towards first person perspective storytelling um, I think there is um, we've never had more ways for people to tell their story with the amount of tools we have the democratization of media um, I think my advice to any people is let go of the control a little bit and bring people in and they will be your ambassadors. <laughs> you know, the people will be your biggest cheerleader if you allow them the room to tell their story. Yeah, definitely. Before I let you go, the last question that I ask everyone is if you can choose the next guest on this podcast, who do you think that I should talk to? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is a great question. I think you should speak to Lizelli Satali, who actually has her own podcast called In Her Corner, <laughs> mm. uh, where she profiles 
uh, women working in the sports industry. So she has such a broad range of perspectives and viewpoints on the on the industry. She's worked with a lot of really interesting companies. And yeah, I think that you should speak to Lavelli because I think you'd have a great conversation. Yeah, definitely. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. My pleasure. Matthew Barrett, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Sports Management Podcast. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, it was great being asked such great questions, some of which I'd never received before. So um, kudos to you and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Sports Management Podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment about what you thought about this episode. If you want to get in contact with me, send an email to sportsmpodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at sportsmpodcast.